Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So I thought I would do another episode in this series that I've started called Revisiting. The first episode uh, I looked at the album Double Fantasy by John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And today I thought I'd review this record. This is Queen and News of the World, which came out in 1977. This is my original copy, which I got when uh, I was eight years old. It was my eighth birthday. And um, I can never quite remember whether it was the first rock LP I ever got. There were three contenders for that, uh, that illustrious position. There was London Town by Wings, there was Approved by the Motors, by the Motors, and there was News of the World by Queen. Got all of them in 1978, never quite sure which one came first, but um, this was certainly my first Queen album, and um, I'd seen Freddie Mercury and Queen on uh, Top of the Pops, probably doing We Are The Champions, and was just absolutely mesmerised. This album was just everywhere. You know, back in 1977, every shop window had it, every record shop window anyway, and children everywhere would just be talking about it, you know, the big killer robot and uh, Queen apparently dead on the cover. Well, almost certainly dead, if you look at uh, Freddie there, he's all covered in blood. And um, this record was a big departure for the band. It came off the back, really, of the two Marx Brothers records, um, Night of the Opera and Day at the Races, from 1975 and 76, retrospectively. And um, those two albums were a high watermark for Queen in terms of sumptuous production, very elaborate arrangements, and they'd really managed to nail their signature sound. And of course, uh, Day of the Races came out in 1976, where the Ground Zero thing was starting to happen with punk. And uh, a few reviews had been pointing out that Queen were, you know, throwing the kitchen sink at everything, as they'd always done, but it was becoming increasingly. Uh, an unfashionable thing to do and Queen themselves went on record at some point during 1976 suggesting that uh, they were going to change direction. So um, what happened was in the early part of 1977 they did an American tour and then they took some time off. Roger Taylor did some solo recording, uh, he released his first solo single and that had a bit of a um, slightly raw sound to it, it was a cover version of an L Parliament hit and um, it did suggest that Roger <clears throat> was maybe leading the way in trying to change Queen's sound around a little bit. He was always the one who was most interested in the punk scene. And um, as we'll see when we get into this record, his tracks, his two tracks on the record have the most punkish sound. If you want to stretch the envelope a little bit in your, uh, in your definition of punk. So the album was recorded, um, I think it was in the summer of 1977, at two different studios. There was... Um, Basin Street Studios, I think, and Wessex Sound Studios, where ironically the Sex Pistols were held up recording their um, one and only album, never mind the bollocks. And there's a famous story of Sid Vicious rolling in drunk one day into the control room of the studio that Queen were using and um, drunkenly saying to Freddie, Hey Freddie, I hear you're bringing ballet to the masses which was a reference to something that Freddie had been talking about in the press recently. He'd been getting more and more into ballet dancing. He'd started wearing a, a unitard on stage, which is a kind of leotard. And um, legend has it that Freddie picked him up by the scruff of his neck and threw him out of the studio. And he used to call him Simon Ferocious, which I thought was quite funny. So um, what happened with this record was it was basically most of it, or large sections of it, were home demos. So, for example, Roger Taylor had pretty much recorded his song Sheer Heart Attack and um, his other track Fight From The Inside just as home demos with him playing all the instruments, all the guitars, you know, bass guitar and everything. And then when they got into the studio, there were just a few overdubs here and there. So on Sheer Heart Attack, Brian May recorded a guitar solo, a particularly screeching guitar solo. Overdubs like that. But it was a big step into the unknown for Queen because obviously they'd always they'd always worked together in the studio, together and apart. It was a bit like the Beatles, where they'd each have their own individual ideas. But obviously it was always meant to be a very unified sound, a very ensemble sound. This record was more... It started the fragmentation, I think, just in terms of each band member doing his own thing. It was recorded quickly as well. Queen had always taken ages to record their albums. I think it was four months for A Night at the Opera and um, quite a long time for Day at the Races too. Whereas this was really thrown together in a matter of weeks, really. They were due to do some more live dates. So they decided just to try and record really quickly. And I think what resulted from that really was a record which to this day probably divides opinion among Queen fans. The old guard Queen fans, who'd been really into the prog rock years and the art rock years, really didn't like this record. They saw it as being too much of a departure, too much trying to kind of break into the 
post-punk pop world. Um, but of course there was a whole new generation of fans which seized on songs such as We Are The Champions and We Will Rock You. And really those two songs laid the groundwork for everything that Queen was going to be in the 80s really. Much kind of shorter, snappier, more concise songs. So there was a bit of a parting of the ways I think with this record. And it's definitely an album which I think Queen needed to make. Um, not every art rock or prog rock band from the 1970s was doing something similar in 1977. And think of ELO doing Out of the Blue in 77 which is their kind of prog pop masterpiece really queen were clearly going down a different path altogether and that will become evident as we just really really quickly go through the tracks i don't want to take too long over it so when it starts off with, with um we will rock you and we are the champions which was a double uh, i think it was a double a side single wasn't it in 1977 and these two songs are just i mean they've become absolute queen signatures um it's difficult to imagine them being written completely separately they seem to dovetail straight into one another but they were completely separate creations brian may did, uh, did we will rock you he was inspired by a concert on the previous tour where the fans had been singing along um, and he just decided he wanted to write something which the fans could join in on so the idea of that song was that it was basically um, really straightforward really stripped back and simple just you know hand claps and foot stomps brilliantly recorded by the, Be uh, by the Beatles, by the Queen's engineer Mike Stone, uh, using special drum risers and they brought everybody into the studio, you know, the canteen staff and everybody to make this really big overpowering sound. And um, so that was We Will Rock You. And then We Are The Champions, Freddie apparently had been inspired by football. So, um, you know, I mean, it became a sporting anthem, as did We Will Rock You, but Freddie had actually been inspired by football. And I think it's one of the most misunderstood songs in the catalogue, really. I think People viewed it as as um, Freddie being incredibly arrogant, you know, and um, but I, I don't think that was the intention behind it. I think it was meant to be a coming together sort of song, and the idea is that we are all the champions, and I think that's one of the things that I think the fans understood that, and Queen's detractors did not. It's a really clever song, I think. Clearly, very anthemic. I love the way it plays on the old lyrics from the old standard "My Way," you know, that it, uh, the line. Um, Bad mistakes, I've made a few. There's a very similar line in my way. It's a very powerful track. Brilliant piano playing from Freddie and some great artillery fire from Brian May and Roger Taylor. Then you've got track three, Sheer Heart Attack, which is uh, a song that had been left over from, that, from 1974, a Roger song which had been written for the Sheer Heart Attack album, but it, he, he, he'd never finished it. And this one is just hell for leather punk, really. I mean, it's punk with a Queen-style flash to it. It was recorded, uh, Roger used a vintage Fender Esquire guitar, so it has a very, it's got a very rich sound to it, even though it's it's apparently very primitive, a bit of a primitive racket, it's actually quite a sophisticated song. Very noisy, very punky, it's got a great lyric, where you're just 17 and all you want to do is disappear, well you know what I mean, there's a, a lot of space between your ears. It's... I think it's almost an evocation of what was happening in London in 1977. Disaffected youth, really, um, seemed to be swirling in Roger's mind. I think he was definitely trying to portray something of what was going on at the time. It's a very powerful song. I've always loved it. When I was eight years old and I heard that for the first time, I mean, it just absolutely just blew my mind, you know, reset my brain. Great song. Then you've got Brian's All Dead, All Dead, which was amazingly written about his pet cat. His, his cat had died and he wrote this very stately, very pretty song with slightly Elizabethan style lyrics, which he'd done before on the Queen 2 album. Beautiful song, one of my all-time favourite Queen songs. Extremely well sung by Freddie with some very delicate guitar work in it. Absolutely beautiful. Then you've got Spread Your Wings by John Deacon, which is almost Queen's one and only Bruce Springsteen moment really. It tells the story of Sammy at the Emerald Bar who wants to fly, fly far away and seek new horizons but he's constantly being slapped down by his employer, you know. It's a song of dissatisfaction and uh, disaffection but he has these kind of grand dreams and it has this very anthemic chorus. Meant to be the only Queen song not to contain any vocal harmonies, interestingly. It was a great song, it was a single but for some reason it was not a hit, and uh, that's a great shame, because I think it's one of John Deacon's finest songs, and certainly one of the best songs on this record. Then you've got Fight From The Inside, which is another Roger song, again very heavy, very dark. It almost evokes boots stamping in darkened alleyways. It's got a real 
primitive, slightly scary quality to it. I think the lyric is meant to be him addressing some kind of manufactured pop star whose image is adorning lots of teenage bedroom walls everywhere. It's quite an angry song, definitely a lot of attitude to it. And you could see again that Roger had, uh, had managed to imbibe some of that punk spirit. So that's side one. I don't think it puts a foot wrong, really. It's really, really concise, very, very direct, and um, just, I think, just, you know, one of Queen's best ever sides of vinyl. And then side two does, it does continue, uh, really, with the high quality. It starts with Get Down, Make Love, which is a really important song for Queen, I think, because I think Freddie was on the, just on the cusp of deciding he was going to pursue, um, you know, an outright explicit gay lifestyle, even though he never publicly came out as being gay. Around about this time, it was pretty unmistakable. If you were in Freddie's social circle, or even if you were on the outskirts of it, you would have known that Freddie was gay. And this song um, owes a tip of the hat, really, to this New York club scene. The gay scene. It's not really a dance song, it's an incredibly inventive song, lots of really clever sound manipulations, courtesy of Brian May's Ecoplex guitar. Again, there's no synthesizers on this record. It's one of the proud claims that Queen always came out with, you know, no synths on this record, but some incredibly inventive sound and strange sound effects. The middle section tips a hat, really, I think, to Whole Lot of Love by Led Zeppelin with all the unearthly screams and lots of weird sounds going on. A scary song, but uh, it's great fun and Freddie's lyric is very uh, risque. It's clearly portraying some kind of bedroom scene and um, it's just great fun. Then you've got a real interesting deep cut from the Queen Deep catalogue, Sleeping on the Sidewalk, which I know some Queen fans have no time for at all. I love it. It was a song, it's totally different to anything you can imagine Queen doing. It was jammed, jammed together in the studio really quickly, written by Brian May, Freddie does not feature on it, it's sung by Brian and it's just a blues rock song really, it's a kind of barroom blues song about a young trumpet player who's um, he's a busker and he gets he gets whisked off to the big time and then when his record stops selling he gets dumped back on the street corner again. It's a fun song, it really shows Roger, John and Brian grooving along and really showing that they could be a great little bluesy bar band which is not the kind of music that you associate with Queen at all. Then you've got Who Needs You by John Deacon, which, believe it or not, started life as a reggae song. It, hard to imagine Queen doing reggae, I know, but um, it morphed into more of a kind of Latin number. And it's a nice song. I don't think it's one of John's best songs, but it's got a pretty melody, accusatory lyric, where he sings, you know, he's, he's wanting his lover to pull up her socks a little bit, I think, and, uh, you know, stop messing him about. It's a fun song, but, you know, nothing too special, I don't think. Then you've got Brian's monumental It's Late, which is a great, great heavy rocker, one of Queen's all-time great heavy rockers. A song written about his guilt, about his um, his marriage, really. Brian had been happily married for a while to his wife Chrissy, but he'd had a couple of flings on the road, um, particularly with a girl called Peaches in New Orleans. He'd got this kind of flame flickering for her. And the idea of It's Late is the first verse he's at home with his wife, and the second verse he is in a hotel bedroom with his illicit lover and in the third bedroom he's back with his wife again but feeling guilty and the song has got a very sturdy riff and of course this song features Brian hammering and tapping you know this uh, this, this guitar technique which became massively popular in the 80s popularized by people like Eddie Van Halen and um, Brian does a good job with that it was a brand new technique at the time he'd seen somebody doing it I can't remember who it was maybe somebody from ZZ Top and he thought he would give it a go and um it's, it's good. I mean, it goes into this very fast and frenetic double time passage, which is something which Brian and Roger could do really well. They did it later in a few different songs, for example, on um, I Want It All, on The Miracle. And there's a few other songs where they do it, where they just kind of, you know, go into double time and get really frenetic. It's great fun. It's a great Queen rocker. Um, and then the album finishes with Freddie at the piano doing his late night cabaret kind of song, My Melancholy Blues, which is a kind of torch song, really. It's just one of those songs, you know, pianist on his own in a smoky bar at the end of the night, and he's playing a song and um, bemoaning the fact that he's been left on his own. Again, much like Sleeping on the Sidewalk, not the kind of material that you associate with Queen, really, and it, I think that, that track really shows the band's versatility and shows... Freddie's genius for being able to just turn in a song like that. I mean, he had done it before. He'd done songs like um, You Take My Breath Away on Day at the Races, very soft, 
with a bit of a jazzy, almost Nina Simone kind of feel. Brilliant way to end the album, because Queen, Queen generally used to like to end their albums on a big, huge crescendo, whereas this record actually ends on a, on a nice, um, quiet passage of jazz piano. Superb. So that's the record, and um, it came out in 1977, like I said, and um, it came with this very memorable picture, which was painted by Frank Kelly Fries, the sci-fi author. Roger had seen the picture, or a picture very like it, on a comic book from 1953. I think it was called Astounding Science Fiction. They approached Kelly Fries, Frank Kelly Fries, to see if he would um, adapt the photo uh, to show the band uh, in the robot's hand and uh, falling to the ground. And then he painted uh, the, uh, the famous extra scene of the robot um, on the rampage. So. Uh, one of the great pieces of um, artwork from the album rock era of the 1970s, and I know it's Roger Taylor's favourite album cover. Um, inside, we just had, um, I'll show you the label, there's the label, and just a, a red lyric sheet with a, a small photo of the band there. And yeah, that was it, no, no posters or badges. There was a few bits of merchandise you could buy. There was, um, I think there was a clock, jigsaw, various other things. I, I never got my hands on any of those things, but uh, it was a memorable album. It was one that rebooted Queen's career. I think the press was was mixed, as it always was with Queen. Record Mirror said, um, it's not a bad album by any means, but could have been better. Rolling Stone said, it makes Queen the first major band to attempt a demonstration of superiority over punk rock by marching onto its stylistic turf. So there was some acknowledgement that in tracks such as um, Sheer Heart Attack and Fight From The Inside that Queen were definitely trying to show the punks, I think. You know, you think that you're kind of raw and exciting, well, we can do that too in our style. And just one thing to do before I finish, just want to quickly show you a tour programme which I picked up on eBay a while ago. This is the Queen Spring Tour 78 and it features, obviously, um, Frank the Robot. He was called Frank in honour of um, Frank Kelly Freeze. This is quite a nice item actually. It has uh, everything that you'd expect to find in a tour programme. Some nice photographs and uh, I'll quickly show you what's what. We've got uh, Freddie in his silver unitard there and uh, a great shot of Roger at his drums with John on bass. Just some sense of the incredible light show that Queen had in those days. And This was um, one particular show on the tour where they got some dancers from a local uh, lap dancing club I think to join them on stage. Queen sexual politics were never particularly great in the 1970s. This is the crown lighting effect where they would emerge from inside it at the start. All good fun. I won't show you every page but uh, some nice portraits of the guys there. So after this I guess you could say this draws the curtain down really on the classic period of Queen. From 1978 onwards, they started to try more and more to get on the radio and become a more of a hits band, I suppose. And then you move into the 80s with the game, and that's when things change. Even though some people do criticise this record, it's the last really solid Queen rock album uh, with some nice diverse touches. And I've always loved it. It's my favourite Queen album, one of my favourite albums of all time. So I hope I've managed to convey some of what I feel about it. And um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Take care, I'll be back soon, bye.